and uh, welcome to the Rebuilding Lives Conference and uh, it's good to be here and it's good to speak on discipleship to you today. Uh, as a way of introduction, my name is Simon Sullivan. Uh, I run the Oaks Project, which is a, a part of the Message Trust uh, down in Withinshaw in uh, South Manchester. Uh, I'm married to Jane. Uh, Jane too is uh, in full-time paid ministry and we have four children. Um, but just to give you a bit of background as to um, sort of, I suppose, who I am, what I do, and why I do what I do. Um, and this is important, I think, because God prepares us for what he's got prepared for us. And uh, our past does become part of our message. Um, so my past is very much to do with the message, I suppose, that I speak about, and certainly today with discipleship it is. Um, but I was saved at 18 from a very dysfunctional background. My mother was in care. She was about 15 when she had me. Dad was in jail. And, uh, you know, out of sort of that mess and that dysfunction, what I love about God is he takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So you could have easily written me off at that, I, you know, and think that I would never get anywhere apart from prison. Well, the funny thing is I did end up in prison, but it was working in prison as a Christian. So that's uh, fantastic how God did that. Um, I had a draft, dramatic conversion when I was about 18, but my early days, my conversion, it was, a, I call it the Grand Old Duke of York conversion. I was up, I was down, I was neither up nor down. Uh, I was very unstable, lots of problems, and I didn't know how to do this Christianity thing. You know, I, I loved the, the buzz of knowing I was forgiven, but the bit that came next was my problem, and I just couldn't seem to navigate any consistency. I couldn't seem to find, um, you know, myself sort of enjoying church and, 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 and submitting to authority and all those kind of things. And uh, I kind of did my own thing and because it was very problematic for those first few years. Um, but then I got, I got into youth work. I started doing youth work for about 15 years. That was voluntary. Uh, we set up youth projects. We set up a youth congregation. And... Uh, and that's while I was in full-time engineering for about 17 years. But actually, it was through a demotion at work, actually. I got demoted one day after about 17 years, and, and that led me to end up working in prisons. And it wasn't something I was looking for. It was one of those things that God had a surprise for me. Um, but looking back now, it, it kind of looked obvious, but I was a bit blind to it. But like I said before, you know, I do believe that God prepares us for what he's got prepared for us. Um, I worked in jail for 10 years, as I said, I worked in Hindley, which ironically was the prison my dad was in when I was born, um, when that was a detention centre all those years ago in 69. So I worked there for a few years, worked in Forest Bank, worked in a couple of other prisons in, on and off. <clears throat> but during that time, saw many conversions. You know, in fact, I would say we saw many revivals at times. But, you know, the thing is, is that afterwards, when all these guys sort of left the prison, very, very few of them carried on with God. It was, it was very hard and, and of course that didn't sit right with me. You know, I had to uh, do something about it. So I sought the Lord and, you know, we ended up, uh, Andy started the MEC project off and uh, with all the jobs and all the, um, the houses and helping people. And, and, and that was wonderful because that's where my heart was as well. I wanted to see actually people grow and people to continue the journey they'd started. But I heard a, a statistic the other day, actually. Um, I don't know how true it is, actually. Um, but it was a prison worker that said this. And he said 90% of people that become Christians in prison fall away. Um, a bit of a disturbing statistic. And if you think about the parable of the sower, and it probably makes sense when you think about it, because Jesus talks about 75% falling away. Um, and if you think of those that we work with who have, you know, sort of really broken lives and... Uh, you know, that sort of 90% sounds like it could be true. But anyway, it was certainly my experience seeing most of them fall away. So we ended up with the Oaks and we moved into the Oaks about five or six years ago. And the Oaks is a discipleship community. It's a family and it's a missional community. So it's discipleship, family and mission. And actually, I think that actually that is fertile soil for discipleship because you've got accountability, teaching and mission in the same place. So that's what we started, we started this house and it's been an interesting journey and we've seen oh, some incredible uh, transformations of people that, you know, maybe without the Oaks might not have actually sort of gone to, you know, be those great stewards they are now. We've got guys here who are working in our businesses, some of the guys supervising, but these are guys which did massive amounts of time in prison and lived lives which 
you know, by their own uh, accounts would say was, was dysfunctional and broken. Um, but like I was saying before, with, with me and with so many of the people I see, that the big problem doesn't happen at the beginning of the journey where people get saved. It seems to be the next step. And Paul talks about salvation in three aspects. He calls it justification, sanctification and glorification. Uh, in other words, we have been saved, we are being saved and we will be saved. So he talks about it in three tenses. But I've found that most people don't struggle at the justification part. They struggle at the sanctification part. Because if you think about the justification part, that's the, that's, that's the forgiveness that Jesus has brought for us. And he's done that. It's a free gift of grace. But the sanctification journey, that's dealing with the power of sin. Not, not our past sins, but the power of sin in our lives. And that's the journey we go on, we find ourselves on, after the justification part. And this is the daily dying to sin and all those things. And that's the bit where I've seen is the most problematic when we try to disciple people, is they just want the, the, the old justification part, the, almost the honeymoon part of it, to carry on and carry on, carry on. But we know in anything, in any growth, we've got to grow and mature and not be just held down by, or, or carried by that sense of the newness of it all. And it's the same with marriage as well. And, you know, with marriage, um, Paul talks about it in Ephesians, and he talks about, you know, husbands and wives and the roles we play. But he talks about the sort of the role, he talks about the mystery of marriage is Christ and the church. And I just, uh, I, want you, I want to just share some stuff about marriage actually, which might sound like, what's that got to do with discipleship? Well, it's got everything. Because marriage is like the sanctification journey. It's like, in fact, it's like all aspects of salvation. Um, a marriage therapist called Di Maria wrote a short guide to the seven stages of marriage. Now, if you look online, there's lots, so you can look at three stages of marriage, five stages, seven stages. But she said this about seven stages. She said, it starts with passion. Realisation, rebellion, cooperation, reunion, explosion and completion. Now I'm not going to go into all of those, but what I am going to do is I'm going to go into one that's five stages. But I just like that one about the seven stages because what I've found is there are stages of growth um, that we need to think about when we're on this discipleship journey. And if we understand this, this will help us so much more in the discipleship journey. <coughs> <clears throat> and as we're discipling people. But in this particular one that I looked at, stage one is falling in love. This is the fuzzy romance. This is the newness. It feels so wonderful because we are awash with hormones such as dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, testosterone and oestrogen. Falling in love also feels great because we project all our hopes and dreams on the person we fall in love with. And this can actually be quite delusional, can't it? Because, you know, if we think that that person's going to be perfect, then, you know, we're going to be in for a shock. Now, we know Jesus is perfect and we know salvation is perfect. But sometimes we have this delusional thing about, you know, salvation. We think that's it, it's all done. And I live in this land of justification, the newness, the honeymoon period. But I like this analogy I heard recently. And this person said this, marriage is like buying a build your own car kit. It will take a lifetime to build and you'll put bits in the wrong places and make mistakes. But eventually you'll create something with beauty and purpose for the journey together. But I think most people actually think of marriage as this though. They think marriage is like buying a brand new Lamborghini, finished and in prime condition. And I think that's how people go into salvation as well without really realising. We think, oh, this is Lamborghini, but it's more of a growth track. It's more of a buy your own car kit and it takes time and it is a process. This is stage two of marriage, according to this person. It says, becoming a couple and building a life together. Many of us rush stage two, but continue to long for the crazy, hormonally driven, passionate love of stage one. At this stage, our love deepens and we join together as a couple. This is a time when we have children and raise them. If we choose not to have children, it's a time when our couple bond deepens and develops. It's a time of togetherness and joy. We learn what the other person likes and we expand our individual lives to begin developing a life together. In movies and fairy tales, the next stage is, and they lived happily ever after. But in real life, 
This is the time when disillusionment sets in and we question whether we should be together. We think we have made a mistake. Some remain unhappily married, some get divorced. Few recognise that they have to... Few, few recognise that they have entered into stage three. So we can see here with this marriage thing, there becomes this point of disillusionment. They, they, and I remember that when I became a Christian, I remember thinking, where have the feelings gone? Where has the joy gone? Where is this great thing that happened to me gone? And, you know, I really, really struggled dealing with emotions. I really struggled with this next part of the journey. Stage three of a marriage, they say, is disillusionment. This is the stage few people know about or understand. It's where the majority of marriages fail today. However, it's not the beginning of the end as most people fear, but it's the right to enter into real lasting love. But take note, it's the, disill it's the disillusionment stage that we undertake too. It's real soul work. It's not for the faint hearted. It requires courage you never thought you had. And the journey can be frightening but the rewards for those who take it are immense. And so it is with the Christian journey as we keep going, pushing in. And Paul talks about, you know, he's running the race, that he's not giving up, that he's continuing. And in the, like we said in the beginning, with that salvation, it's the present continuous tense. Sanctification is present continuous. Stage four is created, creating real lasting love. As painful as the rights are and the loud silences, Never give up on love. Instead of bailing out to go instead of bailing out, go deeper. The benefits of stage four are contained in the name. It's real. It lasts. It is love you never imagined it could be. And it's that and, and you see it sometimes with older couples. You see that the deep love, they're, they're not as fickle. They're, 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 you know, they're there for the long haul. And actually they've stopped trying to fix the other person and make them something. They've actually started to accept who they are, what they are and actually started to allow themselves to be who they are. And, and, and actually that is the, where true intimacy lies. And same again with the discipleship journey. It's the same thing. You've got to come to that point when you realise, I'm not perfect. No one else is perfect. Love covers a multitude of sins. I need to actually calm down and stop judging people and, and, and thinking everyone should be perfect and myself included. Stage five, using the power of two to change the world. And I love this stage of marriage. What would the world be like if every couple had a proper love map and successfully navigated the five stages of love? I bet it'd be more like, I bet it would be more loving and a kinder world where we understood and respected our differences. And actually, isn't that great that actually changed the world? And, and if you look at the stages of our changes, it's like that, isn't it? You know, as we grow and mature, we start to have greater capacity. Look at the parable of the talents. In the parable of the talents, each was given according to his original capacity. But that capacity grew as they were faithful in the small things. But actually you see one guy, don't you, who sits on his talent and buries it. And he's like the guy who just loves the justification part of the journey, but doesn't want to go on to grow, doesn't want to take the challenge to grow, doesn't want to go through the process. And it is a process. And you can't have the end product without the process. You can't just rely on a, a few encounters or a few ups and buzzes at conferences. There's got to be a commitment to the process, as painful it is at times, and as sometimes as wearing it is, but there is no shortcut to actually where God wants to take us. And if we are called to greater things, then we've got to go on this journey so that we have a greater capacity. Because in the power of the talents, because each was given a small amount according to their capacity, but that capacity grew. And actually, if you look at one of the guys who was given 15, he was given 30, and probably the stuff which the other people were unfaithful with. So it's that consistency that God is looking for. But Paul says it in Ephesians 5, and, and he talks about husbands, love your wives, wives love the church, etc. But he says, but, he, but at verse 31 of uh, chapter 5, he says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. This is the profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And that two becoming one, that is the journey of marriage, but it's the journey of discipleship. It's the journey of me realising that I need to allow Christ in me to work through me, and that I can't do things on my own. Because it's almost like the before you're married, it's almost like the picture is of someone that's not died to themselves, but in marriage, the two become one, they have to die to themselves. So the two become one, so the one can become two in Christ, or three, should we say, actually, because it's Christ at the centre. But you see that in the process of marriage that a person learns to die to themselves to please the other person and vice versa. 
But then as a unit, we become stronger. And actually it becomes an umbrella for so many more people. And if I look at my, myself and Jane's marriage, you know, over time as we've learned to yield and submit to Christ, our marriage has become something that helps other people because it becomes a model of Christ and the church. And that's where true discipleship is, is where I submit to allow Christ to move through me. And I go through those stages and I move on, as Paul says, because Paul also says, doesn't he? He says, look, you know, you, you, know, you need to move on from the milk and all this stuff and you need to eat solids. And it's like that with discipleship. It's like that with marriage. We have to move on. And he says, and he also says, and by now you should all be teachers. And what Paul is saying is saying, grow up. He's saying you need to grow up so that the things of God can be done. But actually this also reminds me of um, Jesus because he says, you have, in Revelation 2 verse 4, he says, nevertheless I have hold this against you, that you have left your first love. And when one of the parts of the process of marriage is actually, is at the beginning, it's all hormonally driven. It's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's new, and you feel so good about everything. But there becomes a part in the marriage when the love goes much deeper. And that's what I believe God is calling us to. Not just to have this first love of the fuzzy, wuzzy, romantic part of it, where, you know, and, and because then the next stage is we realise, you, know, uh, you know, we're leaving the world behind and there could be some mourning and disillusionment, but that we move on to mature and grow and we start to realise that this world actually holds nothing for us but actually it's only the life in Christ which really, really makes us grow and takes us on to that end point where our hope is in and that is in the glorification which Paul talks about the resurrection body and, and, and the end things that will come. And discipleship, like marriage, is about forsaking all as well like it is in a marriage. We forsake all actually for Jesus Christ. But also a different illustration that I'd like to draw your attention to is the uses of a horse. Now, first stage of a horse, when you get a wild horse, is you break that horse in. And it's a little bit like the justification part. If you notice when you're working with people who aren't saved, they're as wild as anything, as dangerous as anything, unpredictable. But actually, when they get saved then suddenly they have a master and they start to, well, there starts to not only be a believing and a belonging, but also a behaving. And when I worked in prison, I remember, um, I, I, I saw, there was a time when I saw about 11, 12 guys. I had this big discipleship group. And a lot of these guys were really, really tough lads, you know, hardened criminals, guys from difficult backgrounds, heavy crime. And I remember um, just seeing the difference but I remember someone made it more clearer to me. It was someone who worked for the programs department in the prison and they came to me and they said, um, Simon, um, can I sit in with your group? And, and this person um, kind of had a vague belief in God, but they weren't there because they wanted to do discipleship. They were there because they were running enhanced thinking skills programs with the guys in prison and they weren't seeing much change. But what they'd noticed was these guys who got saved were now behaving differently in the prison. They were behaving differently in the classes. And this woman wanted to know what had happened, what was going on, and, and she thought that it was us. She thought that you know, we had great icebreakers and great teachings and stuff, which really wasn't the case. It was that actually they had a new Lord and Master. And actually, out of accountability to him, their, their behaviour changed. And everyone in the prison saw this. I remember a, a manager, um, a, I think he was a, a governor-grade manager, came up to me. And uh, I only knew him vaguely, he knew what I was about, he knew what I did. And he just came up, walked up to me and he said, um, I'm such and such a person. And, you know, he said, I've just observed what's been going on with you in this group here. And uh, he said, it's remarkable. He said, I've never seen anything like it in my 20 years in the prison service. And he just walked away from me going, it's amazing, it's remarkable, with his back to me. And he was baffled. But it was the power of Jesus Christ that came into them. But that's the thing with the horse. The first stage is we... It has to be broken in. But the next stage is training and work. It's that training that leads to productive work, to fruitfulness, to actually becoming not just a, a horse that looks beautiful, but actually a horse that can be, help you and be profitable and actually you know, pull the plough, lead you into battle, do all those things. And that's the difficult part for so many, that next part, the training, because it's sometimes, like I said, long, hard, tough, and it's not the shortcut route. But the last point, the last part of the horse's journey is where 
it's finished the work and stuff, but now it's a time, well, it's not necessarily finished the work, but it's now not primarily just used for work, but it's, then they now stood the horse. In other words, it's the reproducing of the horse. And that reminds me of Jesus, where he talks to his disciples, who men who've been saved, they've been broken in, as, uh, to put it that way. They've, they're, they're, they're working for him, they're doing all kinds for him. And he says, go into the world and make disciples. That's reproduction. And God wants us to be reproducing, but you reproduce after your own type. But what they do with the horse is they reproduce the spirit of the horse. So that pedigree, that fantastic horse, which is either a runner or is fantastic, they want to reproduce that and they want to breed that family line. And that's the same with us. God has called us to reproduce. So we have to be broken in. We have to go through the training and the work. And then we have to reproduce in discipleship. And at the Oaks, you know, we want to train people to be consistent and industrious. But that means to be fruitful and productive stewards. And that's, that's, that, that is discipleship, isn't it? Productive, fruitful. And it, it takes me back to the Garden of Eden where God says, be fruitful. You know, be fruitful and multiply. But there's that fruitfulness. And that is what God has called us to be fruitful, to be productive as sons. And if you go to Romans 8.15, it's to be sons and heirs. It's to be fruitful and productive for his kingdom. And we want to help people move from justification onwards into the sanctification journey. To not bury the talents, but truly live as the sons I've just said. So we want to help people at the Oaks. And that's what we do. And like I said before, in the Oaks, you know, we have teaching, we have accountability, and we have mission. And it's the fertile soil to actually help and grow people. Now, when I was working in prison, you know, I worked with people in prison and I did my best to disciple teachings and all that. But I didn't really get time to live with the people, to be with them 24-7, to model it properly. In fact, they had to just take my word for it. But actually, when we started the Oaks and we started to live with people, we started to see that actually it has to be modelled because people will catch more. Well, it's more caught than taught discipleship. And you see, you can't make discipleships just by teaching. You can't make disciples just by teaching alone. You know, it is core. It has to be demonstrated. It has to be lived out. And as people live it out, there's a model there. I don't know if you know the story of the um, black eagle that was released from the South African uh, zoo. And this beautiful black eagle had been in captivity for years, maybe 10 years or over. And they took it out to this wonderful place where there was a ravine and high mountains and, and the guy who'd been looking after this black um, eagle, he put its cage on a ledge, a cleft of a rock, overlooking all this beauty. And he opened the cage and he prodded the bird to walk forward as the bird walked forward. And then they waited and they waited and they waited. You know, it took hours and hours and hours and all the photographers were waiting to take the photographs and they said to the man, this, what's, what's going wrong? What's not, why is it not flying out? So the guy went and pushed the bird out with a stick from the back of the cage and he pushed it out of the front of the cage and it still didn't fly. It still stood there. Why? Because it still felt like it was a prisoner. But what happened then was an eagle, a free eagle in the air, flew over, squawking, speaking the same language as this bird. And then suddenly the bird opened its wings and flew. And the thing is this, is the reason why it was able to fly and do it, even though it was possible for it to do it, it wasn't until it saw it demonstrated. It wasn't until it saw it lived out. And this is what we have to do as Christians. We have to make disciples, but we have to demonstrate it. It's not just teaching alone, but we have to live it and demonstrate and take people on the journey with us. And lastly, you know, as we work with broken people, because this is about rebuilding broken lives, isn't it? Or rebuilding lives. It's one of those wonderful things working with broken people because if you look at Jesus' life, who did he call? He didn't call these guys who were wonderful, you know, know-it-all, you know, young um, Jewish scholars. He called fishermen, he called tax collectors, he called sinners, he called the broken. In fact, it confounded everybody when he did that. But what he did with these people, and, and there's a conversation he has with someone, and he says this, he says, he who is forgiven little loves little, but he who is forgiven much loves much. And what I've found is working with broken lives and working with people whose lives have been decimated, 
the rewards are massive. And, and what are the rewards? The rewards are seeing them being fruitful. The rewards are seeing them do great things. You know, the guy who helps me in the Oaks, uh, who, who's my understudy, is a guy who was a heroin addict and was brought up by alcoholics. And, you know, his life was a mess, you know, and his own, in his own testimony, he'd tell you that he was just chaos. He was in and out of jail. You know, but with Joe, you know what I found with Joe is he's probably one of the most loyal and committed people that I've come across in life. And he's so loyal to me and loyal to the house and the purposes that we've got. But he is a broken life that's been restored. And this is what Jesus was talking about. This is what Jesus was doing. This is what Jesus showed the Pharisees, that although these people's sins were as scarlet, you know, these people will be as white as snow. These people... You know, and actually you've heard it said that the problem becomes the answer. And if you look at my life, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Well, like I said before, this is the background I came from. I came from brokenness. I came from where there was no hope. A mother, 15 years old, single parent, dad in jail. You know, but God takes the foolish things, like I said, to confound the wise. He takes the problem and makes it the answer. He takes the mess and makes it the message. He takes the trial and turns it into the triumph, the test into the testament. You've heard the sayings, but that's who we're working with and that's what, we're, that's what we're doing here. So I want to encourage you to live your lives the way Christ wants them to be lived and to take people on that journey. You know, I loved prison ministry. It was great. You know, I used to go in and teach and do those things and have amazing stories and see amazing, you know, stories of justification. But you know, I now have stories of sanctification and we need them both. We need the justification, we need the salvation experiences, we need the highs, we need the experiences, but we need the process, we need the sanctification. And we've got to take people on that and it takes time and it's messy and it will cost us so, so much more. But thank you for listening and I hope this has been of encouragement to you and I hope you enjoy the rest of the seminars. God bless.